Good evening and welcome to Sheffield Live. You are watching African Voices with me, Bailo Jalo and Dr. Kululeko Sibanda. And on today's show, we'll be discussing Nigeria as the country gears up for its presidential election on Saturday. But first tonight, it is a pleasure for me to introduce some of the guests that we have here tonight to help us discuss this beautiful country. To my left is Dr. Ogo Osamu. Welcome, sir. Thank you. And next to Dr. Ogo Osamu is Victor Nweke. Thank you very much. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll be discussing Nigeria, Africa's largest populated country with over 198 million people. It is also Africa's largest economy. Yes, the country has Africa's largest economy with over 200 ethnic groups and more than 4,000 languages. It is home to Nollywood and also home to Afrobeat. The country is preparing for its presidential election on Saturday and we are here to discuss some of the issues or some of the challenges that are facing the country ahead of the election. So if I may start with you, Dr. Ogo Samu, it is just a couple of days left before you Nigerians home and abroad will be going into the polls. Yeah. So what's your take on the country so far as you are preparing for the election? I think it has been quite interesting and exciting to see the conversations about um, the political parties and what they're offering, you know, the people of Nigeria. Um, it's useful to see, too, that there's been a lot of new entrants into the political climate. Um, a lot of them very young people, which is, well, relatively, given, you know, the history of um, the types of, you know, leaderships we've had in the past. It's also useful to see that there's a mixture as well. There are women who are you know, involved, you know, who have been involved in this process. Um, so it is quite useful that we're making progress in that way. A variety coming through, both in terms of um, age, but also in terms of gender. So that's useful. Mr. Mr. Noke, um, uh, look, um, uh, uh, I take the point that uh, uh, Dr. Osomo is putting across that there seems to be some progress. You've got uh, an entrance of women and young people. Yeah. Um, but but uh, uh, is there any, fail, do you think that there is an opportunity for some of these uh, new political parties to make it? But also not just the new political parties, but also maybe an increase in female uh, leaders getting into office, or even an increase in the influence of uh, younger people in the, in the, in, on the outcome of the election. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I will say that uh, my colleague actually threw more light, virtually, mm -hmm. just to add a bit, to tell us the importance or the significance of this new entrance, like you said. Is way back we do not normally see this kind of dynamism or differences. I'm, I'm, I'm not just talking about the difference, like you talk about the younger ones. I mean, to talk about about two, this, uh, I think two third of the registered voters are all youths. Two thirds? Yes. The figure that is about That's close amazing. to about two third mm -hmm. are youths or people who are youthfully inclined, mm. basically, but are youth. So, and um, it's been quite an issue, because uh, before now, it has been an issue of, uh, we grew up, as the saying goes, uh, the children of today are the leaders of tomorrow. Definitely. But over the time, we keep seeing the same leader we were when we were down there in the nursery school, primary school, mm -hmm. the same, same people are mm. still out there, even when we're, get into our, our, how I call it, our 50s. Yeah. So the question is then, when will the tomorrow come? So right now, the youths have decided to take things back to their hand. And it's not just about the difference, it's about the difference of the ideology, ideological difference. I know 
quite an extent, we know how, even within the African con continent, but coming down to Nigeria, there, I mean, the level of cross carpeting gives you, you, you can only but ponder. You cross carpet now, you come back, and all that kind of thing. If there is any ideological difference, you won't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, because you'll be constrained by the ideology which you hold supreme, and which you know that your followers are actually, that's what they have in mind in you, in having you as their leader in the first place. But because we do not have it. But now you could see people that are coming out with different ideology from the parties of the day. When I mean the parties of the day, I mean the two most prominent parties, APC and the PDP. You know, they have something different, a radical away from, you know, thinking outside the box and coming with a more forceful, you know, ideas. Again, coming down to your question when you ask about the, could they be able to make impact, even if, even if now they're not being able to elect it into position, mm -hmm. even if they did not win the presidency or even the House of Legislative Act, but there's no gain saying the fact that many people are, are energized coming for probably in the next election outside this. Mm -hmm. They could see there's a future. Um, and then we can project when they started from the last election, 2015, being able to unseat the, 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 the incumbent, which has never happened in the Nigerian polity. Mm -hmm. So I think people saw it as a tool. Oh, we could do this, meaning we have the power, my vote count, my voice can kind of a thing. And I believe it's part of the genesis towards the journey we are into now. Talking of that, though, the two main political parties, or the yeah. two main parties in the country, which is the All People's um, All, Pe All Progressive Congress, or the APC, yeah. which is run by the President Muhammad Buhari, yeah. and also the People's Democratic Party (PDP), uh, which Atiku Abubakar, the former. Uh, vice president is the, the flag, flag bearer. Yeah. All those two main people, or those two people, they are over 70. Yes. Talking of ideologies, <coughs> um, where do you see Africa as a whole if most of our leaders are all the time in their 70s above and they are preaching something new when their time is about to, be, to end? Um, I, um, I think that, again, this is, you know, the transformation we're beginning to see at least reflected in Nigeria's politics in the sense that younger people now feel able um, to step forward. I think the point um, <coughs> Victor was making uh, about the age distribution uh, within Nigeria, it is believed about 70-80% are youth, you know, within, you know, the Nigerian um, population. So in that sense, it's useful to see that out of that crop, we're beginning to see uh, younger people also come forward. Now, this may not be reflected across of Africa, but I think even in Zimbabwe, when you look at what has happened recently, there's a lot of young people who are involved um, in the push to try and get uh, Mugabe removed and the uh, existing you know, leadership come through. So there's still you know, lots of young people there. Um, so Africa, in, this, in a way, is gradually you know, coming through with you know, young people and hopefully um, newer ideas. Now, the existing politicians, for example, uh, Mohamed Buhari and Atiku, Buhari has always been someone who um, has a social um, program in, in terms of his uh, persuasion. Mm -hmm. He's persuaded to offer, you know, um, social welfare issues, you know, to the masses of Nigerian community um, um, populace. Atiku, on the other hand, because of what the PDP represents, uh, tend generally uh, to favour. Um, the the business class and you know the elite in in that you know sort of general divide. So it's useful then to see that even in terms of the three three and a half years that um, um, the APC has been in power, they've done quite a lot of 
what they've done is really to try and um, <coughs> ensure that the ordinary uh, person has, you know, some chance in terms of uh, benefiting from, you know, the country's wealth and the country's um, um, potential, mm. which one of the criticisms that was made of the PDP in terms of its 16-year rule was that they squandered the opportunities that was before them. Again, that's something which uh, hopefully uh, in the future years, given this past, call it 19 years, um, there will be changes going forward. Uh, but I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's interesting. <coughs> I mean, it, it, I'm trying to piece that. Uh, uh, let, I don't know if we, if, if we, if there are any views here about whether or not we agree that um, uh, a PC generally is is to the left of PDP and that PDP is to the right of uh, uh, a PC. Now the question is, and what I'm not getting uh, uh, very clear here is whether or not um, uh, the, most of our young people are. Uh, in the business class or in the ordinary class, yeah. and if they are in, in any of the, they are somewhere along this spectrum, okay. uh, does that uh, suggest then, therefore, that uh, the election will go, might go Buhari's way, and uh, uh, or does that suggest, if we uh, indeed we have two thirds of uh, the population being young, suggest that the election will go Atiku's way? I mean, somebody just told me before I walked in here that. Uh, Atiku seems to be sitting quite uh, pretty well uh, in terms of expectations out there. What's, I, I, I'm very interested in understanding whether young people are going to make a difference or we are simply going to see the same thing. And I say this because the African Union just uh, has been meeting. Uh, uh, and, and what you, you, you see coming out of there is a group of fairly older people, yeah. right, continuing to churn out the same rhetoric and giving no real prospect for a progressing Africa, for an Africa that can face the new challenges, the very tired faces uh, uh, that we're seeing. And uh, what are the chances that Nigeria can begin uh, uh, in this election without young mm. candidates, mm -hmm. can begin a process yeah. that uh, uh, rejuvenates Africa mm. at its power basis, not just in terms of the support. There are people with young people who are supporters, but uh, aren't really allowing young people to be to be had. Yeah, I think if you look at representation of political parties in Nigeria, um, there's the African Action Congress. Yeah, you know, led or headed by um, Shore or Mole. Yeah, that's uh, the new party again. That's a, it's a new party. Mm -hmm. There's the YPI Young. Uh, Progressive, Alliance, you know, People's Alliance, something, something of the sort. It says young, in it. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, and this is, you know, headed by Mogalu, Professor Mogalu. Yeah. Um, and there's, um, there are two others. I don't fully remember their names, but there's at least five new uh, parties um, that are led, you know, by young young people. And when I mean young, I mean people who are under 55, 56, 57 years old. Yeah. So in that sense, in, in really, okay. if you compare that to say the PDP and the APC, um, there's, young, there's yeah. good youth there. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them are actually appealing to the young people, you know, to the youth. And many of them are making inroads because, probably because of the, this is their, the first time they're, you know, making representation. Mm -hmm. They may not, you know, attract enough uh, vote to win power, mm -hmm. but at least um, they are on the on the step, on, on the, the ladder of progress yeah. you know, in that sense. So if they not, if they don't succeed this time around, I'm almost certain that in the next you know election. Are you are you very are you very certain that the political atmosphere, the political environment in, in, in Nigeria will now allow for new entrants to grab political space? Is that not always occupied and saturated by the main parties? I mean, uh, you, you can look at Britain if you want America. It's very hard to be a third party. Yeah. And, and are, are you thinking that uh, Africa is skipping the oligarchy of the two big parties and uh, going to, into to a stage where you could have uh, a newcomer just bulldozing their way and taking some space? Call me an optimist, but <laughs> um, what I'm seeing and the way in which 
these young and new parties are engaging, yeah. you know, people, um, I wouldn't be too surprised if in the next round of elections, i.e. after this next four years, yeah. um, that they actually make, you know, good um, headway. Because the existing parties have shown themselves um, and people can see for themselves that maybe they should start thinking of alternatives. But here, um, if you look at 2015, when uh, Buhari came to power, he promised, he introduced the broom, that he's there to sweep That's right. the, the, the old government, the old corrupt people. And he promised prosperity in the country in terms of the economy. And he promised, promised to root out corruption. But since he took over power, there has been so many challenges he's facing. And he also promised to get rid of Boko Haram. But those are still challenges that he's facing, Victor, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. And some of these officials have been accused of corruption. And uh, he's been accused of not taking action until lately. And we've seen recently as well, uh, the government abolished uh, the funding of petrol, where there used to be kind of um, subsidy. subsidy. That subsidy has yeah. been taken away from people. And we've seen Nigeria as the biggest old oil <coughs> producer in Africa, struggling. And as I mentioned at the beginning, they are the biggest economy in Africa. Yeah. How vital is it for Nigeria to succeed and for Nigerians to be seen benefiting from the oil resources that you've got or the natural resources that you've got by these governments or by these political parties? First of all, uh, thank you very much. I will go slightly back to try to attend to some of the issues that he raised. So, um, the, the facts are really there, basically. Uh, it's not about affiliation or what somebody, the facts is there to speak out for. The IMF or even your BBC, I mm. could see there are quite a lot of fact fights out. Recently, data are offline all over, not just politically motivated data. These are internationally recognized stuff. Um, the three pointers, the <clears throat> Buhari administration came into power. <clears throat> uh, is virtually did not, has not scored any pass mark on them, just to be, to, to put it mildly. He did not, there's nothing. We checked the corruption index, higher than it was from the people he took over from. When I say higher, substantial, I don't mean matter of one digit percent, mm -hmm. it go to two digits and above. You check the unemployment, apparently, it was somewhere around 8.5% unemployment. Now, we're talking about close to 25% and still rising mm -hmm. unemployment. All right? We could check all the indexes. I could start quoting Martin. Boko Haram is still alive. Then we talk about security. Now, before we we're battling with security as a life and properties, mm -hmm. but even the food security under him is not secured. So any facet of the security thing, is zero. We're talking about Boko Haram, but people forget that under his watch, the fourth largest, fourth, when I say largest, worldwide largest new terrorist group mm -hmm. called what? Fulani Headsmen. That's what's captured, which he refused to even attend to or prescribe, which the world has been beckoning upon him that these are terrorists because of the manner of the way they were, came into being. I mean, they try to say it's not it's Boko Haram that is transcending to Fulham, but we know far better than that. Because. Um, Sorry to interrupt you there. We, from my understanding, uh, he's a Fulani. Will you say that's because of his. No, he, well, we will come to that after all. Article is that he's a Fulani too. So uh, it, it might not just be that easy to say because he's a Fulani. But in my own respect, he has failed to act. And when you fail to act, first of all, you swear in as the president has what? To what? To save what? Life and property. Mm -hmm. In many times, I mean, it's a general concept that he prefers saving the lives of cows than humans. We know when he sent down the military was to protect the headsmen, not about the people that have been devastated, killed, and all that. We, if we go into that, that's another thing entirely. The figures are there to talk about the lives that were lost within him, 10,000 within his reign. Now, these are the frustration for people who had wanted him to come in to cleanse, like you said, the old brigade. There was a man's, I mean, when we talk about corruption, it's another, I think they have to look for another word. 
basically, because corruption makes it so level. The, the previous government were noted to me. It, it was like an institution, it was like a thing. It was the order of the day, all right? And then we taught him, because he did it when he was in military time, and he had this, like he said, social internal about the human. That's what we thought. Mm -hmm. But of course, leaning around the line, people know about his inclination of his religious inclination, which cannot be pushed aside. He has been quoted to make some comments that are, you know, taking Sharia from down to whatever he called. So he had that on tape, those inclinations somewhere. So it's still on the line of people's mind. But then you want this corruption, you want somebody to want to are fight. You, are you questioning his religiosity? Is it a problem that he is religious? No, the fact, no it no. can't be a problem. Nigeria is such a beautiful place where we intermarry and it works perfectly well. Okay. We could give instances of strong politicians who have, even the article has a wife as a Christian, Lagos State former governor who is presently a minister. I mean, let's not go into it. But also it's a country that has too much of religious problems. So, yeah, mm -hmm. at times, those people are, are fanned by political inclination or that, but it is still a, a tool. But what we should understand here, we shouldn't take away from that, is that there are disgruntled youth, people who are unemployed, who have no means of livelihood, who all you need is to find a little faith. Oh, he says this about your and religion and this crisis. And it's crisis. Yeah, I get that. Let me get get the, the doc to, to to come in here because I think you've made a, a strong point there, and I think you might want to respond to some of the yeah. uh, uh, some some of the points you're making there. I think it's um, difficult to make certain statements because, um, especially with social media the way it is, yeah. all sorts of you know stories can be put out there and, you know, make them look as if they're reality, and that's the fact of the matter. Um, but we know that this APC government has been in, you know, in power for about three and a half years. Um, they actually talked about what they inherited in terms of the challenges they inherited. We had um, a government that was in power for about 16 years, and delivered not very much, it seemed, because the Nigerian people were already fed up, you know, if you follow the history of, you know, what transpired. So it seemed easier for the APC uh, to be supported because people, and as, you know, Victor rightly said, um, saw Buhari in terms of his integrity and what he's done in the past, and the APC as well, you know, as people who will bring serious difference and change. Now, what we must not forget is, and he made the point as well, um, Buhari made the point when he was being inaugurated, that when you fight corruption, corruption fights you. Now, you're dealing with a situation where lots of people who are opposed to the APC have lots of resources. We have institutions that are not working, functioning properly. There are issues with the judiciary, for example. There are lots of people who are brought in, you know, taken to court and stuff like that. But it, you find that it's difficult to prosecute these cases because of the issues within the judiciary. Is that a fault of his or a fault of the system in Nigeria? Precisely. <clears throat> That's the point I'm making because these are um, issues that existed within Nigeria before... Doc, Doc, why do we have an election three years after a government has been elected? Why? why for, for well, it's a four-year four term. Four years. Okay. Four years. Yeah. yeah, each term is four-year term. Yeah. So he promised to make a difference within that period. Why hasn't he made a difference? Well, he has made quite a lot of difference, yeah. to, be, to be frank with you. He's made a lot of difference. It's just that when you look at um, three years, in, in a political system or a political climate where people already, you know. It's a second. Yeah, <laughs> there are serious, it's a very, very short time. Yeah. And this is why, in some respects, it would be useful, but it's also down to, you know, how the voting goes, that they have another four year term. And then we'll probably see. Uh, whether or not they've done well. I mean, four years is hardly enough. Okay, Doc, um, sorry to interrupt you there, but we've got less than 30 seconds to go. I would just like to get a prediction from both of you. Just a quick one. 
I mean, it's quiet. It's quiet. I, will, I, will, I cannot give you a prediction without just saying just one or two things, and I will try to make it very brief. Okay. First of all, the issue of, um, um, I guess we talked about that. There are too many cross capitated people who move from one party to his own party to get him into power. Let's not get that. Buhari's These are, party. Buhari's party now, from PDP to APC. <clears throat> These are the corrupt ones, well noted. People who are scared of being prosecuted. Now, APC is coming out to tell you, oh, come over to us. We will wipe away all your sins and nobody will be prosecuted. And you call that person not what? That's another question we we'll have to ask. At times when we talk about corruption, it's not about, he is seen as Mr. Integrity, but that has been compromised terribly. Okay. I mean, it has been on quote on this. We don't have to go into that. I'm talking about the prediction you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it will be quite difficult. All right, it's a money back policy, but now youths are a very big thing because people seem to have that mentality we can do it, take the money and do otherwise. Showery is one of the person who's going to model this water a bit in the sense that he's going to distort the statistics because he came up with this. We did that when we were in Unilag, when he was the announced president, student union president. He did things like that. There were money bags from Babangida then, all right. And uh, to stop them, the riot we were meant to do at them to distort him. Okay, they got the money, but did what they wanted so to do. We can yeah. give Dr. Tang as well. Yeah. I think um, we, again, because of our experience of you know politics across, well, within Africa and in Nigeria as well, the tendency, especially the dominant ideology of the individual, we have this individual cult. It's almost as if this leader. Um, is the person who will answer all the questions. But in fact, we should be looking to the political parties themselves because it's within the political party framework that you'll know where success would come from. And one of the reasons the African Action you know, Congress that Shora leads uh, has a good potential is partly due to him, but also partly due to his own political party. Now, the APC mm -hmm. um, has um, a structure within itself that's offering, you know, to be a lot more What's your prediction, successful. Doc? My prediction is a difficult one because I still think APC might come in, might still win the day, but it's, a, it's touch and go. The reason being this, um, the African um, um, Action Congress, the but also this, this um, you know, the, um, the PDP that seem to be making her, but I'll be surprised if the Nigerians choose the PDP. If it's free and fair, PDP will take the order of the day. Well, that's are the views of those two people that you can see here. Yeah. But don't go anywhere, we'll go for a short break and we'll be back soon.